Press the bell icon on YouTube and don't miss another update. Uh, Aurobindo very powerfully says, I mean, you know, very presently, he says the irony of the modern age is that the age of radical subjectivism, where we grant each, each person the right to say my truth, my experience, my reality, should be the yardstick by which I can lead my life. What is it about this very age, this age of radical subjectivism, that actually produces nationalism. Right? Now, the reason I wanted to kind of share this large thought and this sort of somewhat abstract perspective with you is because I think this is a perspective on the dangers of modern freedom. Right? And I, by dangers, I don't mean that it's a reason to give up freedom, but it is the sense that there is something lacking in the modern liberal conception of freedom in its individualistic form, right? This narrative kind of got eclipsed. It got eclipsed for a variety of reasons. Uh, it got eclipsed partly because I think one of the features of our discourses of globalization and development was a kind of theodicy of reconciliation, right? Which basically argued that the broad normative contours of the world we want to inhabit development, uh, the greater penetration of markets, the modern state. The basic ideas behind this architecture are all fine and all in place. All we need to do is find the technical means of, as it were, reaching there, right? And the means that we deployed to get there largely spoke the language of a certain kind of technical managerialism. Right? Yes, you have to be populist, you have to speak to the people, but largely to, as it were, manage them, right? Manage them strategically, right? I think Krishan Kumar once nicely said that, you know, what has democ democracy become, right? Democracy is really about the strategic management of the population, right? It's not really, in some senses, about, right? What will be the forms of collective empowerment that make people identify through agency? with the collectivities that, in a sense, uh, surround them, right? And I think, as I said, it is a question worth asking whether the phase we are seeing in global politics, right, not just here, the United States, Eastern Europe, which coincided with two things together, the expansion of what I call provocatively Warren Court liberalism, right, using judiciaries to expand the space of personal rights, right, and a kind of technical managerial capitalism, right? right? And both of them had tremendous successes. I mean, I don't want to minimize the gains both of them produce. But that combination itself is the very thing that then produces or creates the condition, right? Of the kind of nationalism we are seeing. But there's another reason so I think dwell on this larger story about the worries about freedom. Is that if this age of radical individualization can create the, the groundwork for nationalism, let's look at one other threat or one other sets of threats to our freedom. We often in our politics, I think rightly so, use words like totalitarianism, authoritarianism, very conventional political categories. Right? To inoculate ourselves against the encroaching threats of state power and political power, right? And that threat is palpable, right? It's probably going to only grow in this mad year. Uh, but it's a very familiar threat to us. We understand the political vocabulary in which we can articulate. <clears throat> but I think there's many theorists I mean, if you think of in the context of the Aadhaar debate, um, think of somebody like uh, Bernard Harcourt have pointed out, out. The smartest thing modern authoritarians have done is figured out that they can use the people's desires themselves to create a new regime of surveillance and authority, right? The dystopias we used to worry about, right, were George Orwell's 1984, right? Totalitarian societies, right? Centralized control, right? 
over thought processes, right? 2 plus 2 really equals 5, the monarch says it is, right? Right? Okay. Yes, that kind of control remains a distinct political possibility. I don't think we should underestimate how possible that kind of control is. But if you look at the kinds of instruments of state power that are being used to threaten and curtail liberty, right? Uh, for example, justifications for increasing state surveillance, right? Uh, justifications for making all of us completely transparent to each other through something called, oxymoronically called, anonymous data, right? What are those tendencies trading on? They are trading on our desires. It's the state being able to tell us, or in, in some cases, if not the state, private corporations being able to tell us, right? Trust us with this power, because this power, or what it can get, is what you really want, right? And, the two pillars of this tapping into our desires for justifying new regimes of, of, of surveillance, one very obvious, as I just said, is a kind of technical efficiency around being able to meet individualized desires, right? The consumer is sovereign. We can serve the consumer better, right? Or we can serve the citizen better, but not citizen as in a form of collective empowerment, but citizen just as in the role of a recipient of a particular service, right? Uh, but the other pillar of this is, of course, the production of fear. I think we underestimate sometimes the degree to which 9-11 was a watershed moment in global democracy, right? Because what 9-11 legitimized, right, really, I think, in all democracies across the world, was the idea in some very deep and profound sense that fear can lurk everywhere. And if it lurks everywhere, the presumption of innocence and guilt can actually be shifted. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of distilling its essence. 